uh, well, firstly, thank you very, very much for the invite today. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Uh, 30 years since POWs was, was born, uh, which makes me feel uh, already incredibly old. Um, but really, I want to sort of talk, I want, to, I want to start really from a bit of a controversial position, given what we heard this morning. Now, 1968, Naomi Weinstein in the States uh, wrote uh, a lot about the lack of a psychology of women, and this is a very uh, well-used quote that's, that's used in sort of psychology of wo women circles. Um, now, given that we've already been hearing this morning about lots of eminent uh, female psychologists, 16 uh, founding members of the BPS and the enormous work that uh, women contributed to in terms of projective tests and very famous uh, Anna Freud. Um, it sounds a little bit controversial or contradictory that here I am saying Naomi Weinstein said that psychology knows nothing about psychology, what, what they're like, what they need or what they want, because they simply don't know. Um, but really, I'm sort of talking from or she was talking from the position of broad, broad psychology, um, the public gaze on psychology um, and people entering psychology. But I also think perhaps we should be rewriting this quote uh, to talk about the fact that psychology had not heard women, that women were there and they were lost. So maybe in a few years' time we'll be talking about the sort of women's psychology that, that we're now hearing about, um, or the women's psychology that was remembered rather than forgotten, because I think it's still pointing to a very clear institutional uh, gender bias in terms of the ignoring the presence of women. Um, Naomi Weinstein wasn't the only person who was talking about this. Um, there was a, another couple of women who wrote a very uh, influential um, paper which was um, called, uh, where is it? Uh, what? Oh gosh, I've lost it already. No, oh, there it is. Uh, it was called Psychology Reconstructs the Female uh, by Mary Crawford and, and Jane, uh, Janine Marrick, uh, where they encapsulated this position in terms of this sort of phrase, womanless psychology of really trying to sort of say, the psychology we have, the body of psychology that we have is womanless. It's created by men, it's for men, it's consumed by men, and it's really not about what women are interested in. So writings like this and this sort of perspective in the US really started a sort of organizational uh, movement, um, talking about so trying to get psychology better positioned for women. Um, and out of this movement came originally what was called the Society for the Psychology of Women in the US. And from this developed the 1973, in 1973, the Division 35 of the APA, which is sort of equivalent to the BPS sort of section. But this was formed in 1973. So we've got to remember this. So quite a long time ago now. And the Society for the Psychology of Women. Now, there's a number of storylines behind why this was created, um, but a very common narrative and one that we, we could take different narratives and critique this narrative, but the very common one at that time was women were seen as the other, women were seen as a noisy variable that's best dealt with by actually excluding it. So we'll keep the noise out, we'll just look at men. Um, and then forgetting really that the research upon which this, uh, the theories upon which this research was uh, based was, was actually solely about men. Uh, and that when actually women were then looked at, their characteristics seemed to deviate or they didn't seem to sort of uh, act in accordance with the theory. And as a result of that, they're seen as other, as abnormal and often pathologized. And there was lots of research that was coming out to actually substantiate and support that sort of storyline. Now, that's what was happening in the States. Back in the UK, we seem to be a little late coming to this conclusion, um, or at least doing something about it. And I just want to spend a few moments at this point just sort of telling you about sort of these early developments in the UK and sort of how we got to where we are today. Um, 
some of the things I just want to point out that there are other things that happened along the way, but some of the things that were significant to me and, and sort of my history or the, and the people I was involved with, um, I'll, just, I'll just point out. Firstly, a couple of books that happened. Um, 1975, Una Hartnett and Jane Chetwin put on a symposium, uh, a BPS symposium uh, about sex roles. And this was perhaps one of the first times that sort of gender had actually appeared as a sort of consolidated issue as a symposium at one of the BPS conferences. Following the success of that and the interest of that, there was a conference at the University of Wales Institute of Science and Technology, which is now merged with the University College Cardiff to be one university. That happened in 1977. From that, a number of these two books then arrived. First one, The Sex Role System in 1978, and followed by a further edited book in 1979, particularly on women and sex role stereotyping. One of the next significant events, and there were other ones, but these, these are particularly interesting ones, I think, was in 1983 at a BPS social psychology conference, um, Sue Wilkinson put on a symposium called Feminist Research. And I think this was probably the first time the, sort of the F word was actually used in this context uh, on the BPS uh, conference uh, agenda. Um, now, this started quite a lot of dialogue and conversation. And a small group of women got together uh, in 1984, including Paula Nicholson, Alison Thomas, and, and various other people. And forgive me if there are other people in the audience who were involved at that point. Um, but they started to talk about the possibilities of a feminist section of the BPS. Now, even the word feminist and BPS in the same sentence at that time felt risky. Um, Paula Nicholson actually wrote a sort of background paper to this, why people were thinking about this and why it would be useful, uh, for the then BPS Bulletin. You might recall it's a sort of little paper thing that used to arrive instead of the psychologist. Um, but it was rejected. It was not seen as the sort of thing that they'd want to publish in this journal. The next really significant thing that happened was, at that point, the Economic and Social Research Council used to put on a very good conference every year for postgraduates. And there was a group of women who got together at that conference, uh, I must admit, over a few glasses of wine, um, uh, young PhD students who took up this conversation and became very passionate and very concerned, very interested to do something about it. Uh, and that's where I entered this story, because I was one of those PhD students. Um, now, sort of, it's interesting that sort of we, we've been talking about pioneers and past pioneers and present pioneers, and uh, I was reminiscing with somebody earlier on today talking about this seems very strange because it was only yesterday that I was a PhD student, uh, and now I'm living history. Um, <laughs> So I, I will get over that in a while, but I, it's made me feel a bit old. Um, so at the time, I was actually a PhD student at UIS, where Una Hartnett was at, um, University of Wales Institute of Technology. Um, it was, despite Una being there, it was a largely male psychology department. At sometimes she was the only female academic on staff. Other times there were, there were two. I think we maxed out at three once. Um, but it was a very male-dominated department. And even though Una had done very se seminal work in terms of sexual uh, stereotyping and the psychology, the early beginnings of a psychology of women, it was very much overshadowed by the, the, what was known, uh, what the university was known for, which was large ministry defense and post office grants on the ergonomics of control panels. Now, I wasn't really interested in that. Um, my PhD was about actually the quality of life of people with uh, intellectual disabilities who'd actually moved from institutions into small community homes, um, mostly in the Welsh Valleys. Um, so I was doing sort of fairly ethnographic work, going out, following these people long term, uh, but also working with a lot of the carers who, was looking, who were looking after these, these people. Um, I'm, well, all of these women, all these carers were women. And it was starting to strike me that actually 
there was a really interesting gender issue here, because why these women were being employed was because they had really good homemaking skills, domestic skills, and caring skills. But whilst they were being employed for those skills, actually they were never acknowledged and never really valued. So my sort of PhD started to take on a sort of gendered flavour, even though I hadn't sort of started out there. Um, but that postgraduate conference was probably one of the first times, the first time, I think, that I could voice these feelings of the fact that I really felt a round peg in a very square hole in that department. Um, and interestingly, lots of other female psychologists, uh, PhD students, were feeling very much the same and had dialogues about not fitting in, uh, being advised not to do the research they wanted to do, not to do it in the way that they wanted to do it, um, and that they wanted to do research with people, not on people. Uh, and when they argued with their supervisors or sponsors about this, they were being told, just shut up, get on with it, dearie. Uh, and not to be so critical. So there's lots of stories about that. Um, so whilst my research didn't start out as being woman orientated or feminist, it certainly became informed by these values and critical perspectives. Uh, these days, most of my research is about disability in sport and uh, quite the elite end of sport. Um, but I can still say it's very much influenced by these, these values in terms of what I want to study, with whom, how, and most importantly, what I do with it. And I'm going to talk a bit more, more about this sort of issue of what we do with our research later on. But back to the main plot of the uh, trying to get a section of uh, feminism psychology or feminist psychology in the BPS. In those days, to get a section, you needed uh, 20 fellows or uh, uh, assistant fellow, uh, associate fellows and 100 members signatures um, to support a section. You had to go through a variety of committees, including the Scientific Affairs Board, the Council of the BPS. You had to consult with all the other sections to make sure you're not standing on their toes. Uh, and then it has to go to a sort of general meeting, usually held at a BPS conference, to get approval. So it's quite a sort of bureaucratic process to all of this. Now, there was an immediate problem in that the majority of fellows and associate fellows were indeed fellows. <laughs> and they were either not terribly interested or had other quite different views to us, um, such as one head of department who articulated to me that he would sign our proposal um, because he was indeed certainly very concerned for women and that they did need help from psychology. I accepted his signature. It was a signature. <laughs> However, and, and funnily enough, he always went down as one of the founding members. <laughs> and I thought there was a lovely irony to that. Um, so we went and talked to lots of people. Um, we built up our networks. Uh, but it, in these conversations, it was immediately clear that some sort of women's section uh, of the BPS uh, was something that is threatening and should be treated with great caution. And you could see people sort of almost step back and be very careful what they said to us. And we had lots and lots of questions. Does it fit? Is it separatist? Uh, it was often thought that we were only going to allow women to join it. Is it political? Um, or the one I like best, and uh, let's quote here, uh, it might be a section if its main emphasis was to be on the scientific study of womanhood, presumably in comparison to men. Now, some of these questions are really easy to answer. No, it was not separatist. Why should it be? Um, does it fit? Well, the purpose of the BPS to, is to represent its members, isn't it? So uh, surely the BPS needs to actually accommodate and be fit to purpose for its members, was our perspective. Uh, is it political? Well, isn't everything political? Is that a bad thing? Isn't the BPS political? It was a certain irony, because also there were negotiations going on at that time about sponsoring MPs by the BPS. Not political, of course. <laughs> uh, but we all knew what the answer should be, and the answer was no, of course it's not. Um, but it's that, that sort of quote about sort of uh, womanhood that, that really got us puzzled. Because firstly, we didn't know what womanhood was. Um, 
what is womanhood? Well, surely womanhood is about the study of women, which is what we wanted to do, so fine. Uh, but the second bit was, so we can only look at women in relation to men. Uh, well, psychology's been looking at men largely not in relation to women for quite a long time, so what's the difference here? What's the problem? Uh, but these dialogues were obviously sort of had to be fought through and negotiated through. But there was definitely a smell of fear in the air, and this was correct. We did indeed want to uh, get to look at women uh, in and outside of psychology. We wanted to get more women involved in psychology and in influencing psychology. Uh, and in sympathy with the great George Miller, we wanted to give psychology away to women, especially in terms of Naomi Weinstein. So what we wanted to do was essentially feminist, based on a belief in inequality and enacted through what we researched, how we researched it, and what we did with our findings. And we, going back to sort of earlier conversations this morning, we wanted to shake up and continue that sort of shake up of the false dichotomy between the researcher and the researched. However, in terms of the BPS, we were busted. Uh, and there are a couple of quotes here. Oops. Um, from the feedback from that sort of first BPS council meeting where we presented our sort of proposal to get a section. Um, and as you can see from these quotes, it was sort of, it didn't really matter what we wrote. It was our intentions behind that were being judged, um, which was, you know, a quasi-political pressure group. And there was a certain truth to this. We wanted to be that. But we also knew we couldn't say we wanted to be that. We knew we had to write the game. So it was a sort of slightly frustrating position to be in. Uh, it was also important to notice uh, at this time that the BPS was applying to be a chartered society, a royal chartered society. And there was a lot of concern around about the external image and fears of being seen some, as something else other than a learned society. And that phrase, learned society, became imprinted on my brain. Uh, another piece of feedback we got was the neutrality of the society in the eyes of the government might be compromised if campaigning groups were allowed within the society. If only we had such power. <laughs> but, you know, these were what we were being judged upon and, and the gate was being firmly shut. So we're not going to win this war by just saying the right things but really wanting to do different things. We had to reach some sort of rapprochement. Uh, but what was happening with us very much echoes the sort of campaigns and the developments of the organizations, both in Australia and in the US, but also Canada as well. So we took a step back, we rewrote our proposals, we got our signatures, we consulted the committees, we presented uh, the request uh, to have a s women in psychology. We took out the word feminist, nowhere did it appear in our proposal. Uh, and it went through to the BPS uh, Council in 1985. Now, they promptly voted against it, uh, 21 against, seven for, and four abstentions. That had never happened before. If a section had got to that point, it usually was just passed straight through. Um, I have to say, we weren't terribly surprised, um, but by this point, we'd got the grit in our teeth, and we were in full swing organizing a conference. And that was back to Cardiff, that's happened to be where I was, but also Matt uh, Adema, who was also then a big, big uh, influence at this time. Uh, we weren't to be daunted, we put on our conference. Um, now, this conference, we managed to get uh, absolutely full program. We had international speakers, we had Dale Spender talking in the evening. Uh, we got 250 women there, three men. Uh, and we charged, the most interesting thing, and the thing that I'm really proud of, is we charged two pounds for waged and one pound for unwaged, and we made a profit. <laughs> we got Sarah Delamont, who's a sociologist uh, at the University College Cardiff then, managed to swing us to get room hire for free. We got our mates to do the publicity, we got other friends to do the, the uh, catering, and we just really worked hard and put it on. And that was a very, a more important sort of turning point and gave us a fuel determination to carry on. Um, 
And really, we decided at that point, we need two organisations. We need WIPs, Women in Psychology, that could be explicitly feminist, and PALS that could work more from the inside within the BPS and meet the requirements to be a learned society. Um, WIPs carried on, had another conference in Brunel, uh, 18 months later, had a good membership, about 200 people at that point. But by January 1987, we'd learned a lot about the BPS. We knew more about how it worked, uh, we knew more about how to lobby, although we were never, we were told never to be seen to be lobbying because that would be political. Uh, and we knew we had to convince certain senior men and women of what we were doing and to be seen to be fitting in. So we rooted our activism through WIPs and we rewrote the POWs proposal. Uh, not from our hearts, but more from our sort of brains in terms of the position of science and the psychology of women. Uh, the proposal with 262 signatures went to the Scientific Affairs Board uh, in April 1987 and then the Council in May 87. It got approved. Two, two against, everyone else for, so that was good. And at the BPS general meeting uh, that year in December, the December conference, we had 300 members of the BPS uh, confirm their intention to join. That was the largest support any section had ever got. And of course it went on to be one of the largest and most flourishing, flourishing sections of the BPS and continues to be so today. It was, being a committee member at that point, a little bit of a, a bittersweet victory. We were still very closely scrutinised in terms of what we were doing and I received many letters uh, from the BPS executive telling me off about what I could and couldn't do and what we could and couldn't do. And it's very interesting to hear uh, Elizabeth's uh, presentation this morning and the different ways of, of behaving. And I think we fell into the trap of overcompensating. We sort of took the Mary Curie route on that we gave a POWs response to every consultation that was going. We made sure we had a committee member on everything and we were burning ourselves out with doing things that we were not really interested in doing. Um, and I always remember this very clearly. It was at one committee meeting with um, uh, Janet Sayers, I think, was chair at the time. She used to quietly knit at these meetings. And uh, we were busy doing all this BPS work, being uh, what then we described as being the handmaidens of the BPS. Uh, and she said, why are you doing this? And we all thought, well, why are we doing this? And we stopped doing it and we changed direction. But we were still very closely scrutinised. I remember one of the first things we did as a section, you get an automatic symposium at the BPS conferences. And the first one we put on Jane Usher organised was feminist clinical psychology. It was turned down because it was too political. It had that word feminist in it. WIPs staggered on for a few years, but then died as we really couldn't keep two organisations going. We didn't have enough energy and one organisation had no infrastructure at all. But POWs continued and grew from strength to strength. So the big question for me was, was it, was it worth it? Right, where are we at now? Was it all worth it? And I think it comes down to sort of three topics on the agenda, which were the sort of three topics we kept grappling with in those early days. Researching the topics we're interested in. Um, I think we've seen a massive development here, massive extent, extension in terms of the range of topics uh, and the types of people that are being engaged in research and engaging in research. We still have massive institutional uh, influences which dictate and boundary what we research. And we're talking about REF or funding councils. But in terms of younger people, young people entering the career of psychology in terms of PhD topics, I'm not hearing the previous conversations about will this be good for your career? Don't you think you should do something a bit more mainstream? Isn't that a bit political? Aren't you a bit close to this topic? Uh, and in those days, we used to have, oh, well, there's nobody to supervise you and certainly nobody to examine you. Um, but I might be leading a bit of a protected life these days. Uh, I think critical psychologists would never want to use the word emancipatory in the same sentence as psychology. Uh, but I think we have had some emancipation. Uh, I think we now have a second generation of psychologists who are looking at these wider topics, or topics of interest to women, uh, and enabling their development and expansion. In terms of methodology in the research that we want to do, uh, some splits obviously still remain. Um, So-called hard, soft approaches, mixed methods, perhaps is now 
not the dirty phrase it used to be. Uh, and many psychologists position themselves as taking more of an integration, integration, integral, you know what I mean, approach. Uh, however, we're still operating in, a con in the context of contested definitions of science, data, evidence, and where some approaches are valued more than others. Uh, but certainly on the continuum of pluralism, I think we have managed to edge along that scale. I think that the confluence of critiques from a feminist psychologist angle combined with social psychology and the now well-established field of critical psychology, dare I say, I think has just about degendered de this debate. And I think the debate has moved on more into the arena of power, economics and equality. The, th the third agenda item, finding a place in mainstream psychology, or actually becoming mainstream psychology, which is what we really wanted. Um, one of the first things we did when we got POWs through was actually look at, to look at the editorial boards of the uh, BPS journals. Uh, because we were hearing a lot of complaints from women saying, it just can't get published. They were getting published in the States, they were getting published in journals outside of psychology, but they were not getting published in UK journals. Um, so, we had a little look at the editorial boards of these journals. And I sort of rooted through my old archives, but I couldn't find the actual results. But I remember being absolutely shocked, and the committee being shocked, at the very low representation of women on these boards. So, quietly, and without definitely minuting it in our minutes, because they were scrutinised, <laughs> Um, we set about a strategy, and our strategy was to make sure that we increased the representation of women on all of these editorial boards, and that we also supplied names of women who would be referees, who would also join the, the boards of associate editors. Uh, now then, in terms of academic journals, they're very much the gatekeepers to academic progress, and they create the look of the discipline. So we. We really wanted to widen that gate and feminise that look. And it was probably everything the BPS feared, a bit of feminist direct action. So we then, how far have we come? So I actually went and I asked Sarah, my really helpful research assistant who's somewhere in the audience to actually do this uh, for me. We went and had a look at sort of who's on the editorial boards today. And this is sort of some of the results. I think it makes, well, it certainly makes a hell of a lot better reading than 30 years ago. Um, you know, there's still movement, uh, but it's certainly progressing in the right direction. And I think, you know, it's interesting, we had a conversation earlier on about uh, Athena Swan and the leaky pipeline of losing people along the way. And I think we still see those institutional barriers to women taking up these positions. Uh, this is also in the context, as we know, we've mentioned already the number of male professors compared to, to the small number of female professors. We still have a massive academic pay gap in uh, academia, and we still see research being published today about gender bias within publishing and the quality of research. But it's this, going back to sort of my agenda there, it's this fourth one that I'm particularly interested in. Now, a few years ago, I was asked to give a keynote at the PALS annual conference, uh, and I called it uh, Toxin or Tonic, Our Contribution to the Admiral Transformation of Opportunities for Women. Now, that, that, that's a little quote from the then university uh, minister's David, Minister David Willits, and he was writing at this time about basically feminism being the single biggest factor in the lack of social mobility for women. Uh, men and women, well, particularly men in Britain, uh, and basically blaming women for taking up these positions that uh, ambitious uh, men from working class background would have taken up instead. Now, so that got me thinking, yet again, in this day and age, we've got a man in a very influential position blaming women for the position of men. So let's actually have a look at equality. So within that talk, I looked at... Uh, Three big issues, power, education, and health. Now, you don't get very far down the line of, of looking at those areas without coming against the fact that we have gross inequality in all of those areas. It still exists. 
and that basically individual, group and organisational psychologies are still very much part of that problem and create it. And there's a hell of a lot to do in terms of aligning the practice of psychology to address this problem. The biggest problem we have today is the inequality and all that stems from it. So in my talk to Powers, I sort of had a little bit of a poke at Powers. I took a little bit of a sort of uh, shaky position, said, well, you know, actually, how much are you getting out of the ivory tower? How much time is being spent on esoteric debates uh, that really have very little relevance to women who are literally on the streets? Um, so when I was preparing for my talk last week, uh, I was really surprised that arrived on my table uh, it was a ballot paper from the psychology uh, of women section with a name chase change proposal uh, to the psychology of women and equality section, which sort of very nicely dovetailed with where I was going with this. Now, so we can see here we've got a massive progression from originally talking about psychology without women, we're talking about feminist psychology, we're talking about women in psychology, we got to a position of women psychology of women, and now we're adding another nuance there. I think it's worth just very quickly looking at sort of the aims of that section. Um, those are the original aims there, and you can see sort of they're probably sort of what you might expect. Um, that last one for the original aims to set up a new initiatives in the area of policy making and education respect to the scientific interest section. I remember having to battle and fight and fight and lose it that we had to put the scientific interests of this section in. So you can see the sort of influence there. But if we look at the new, the two new aims that are being proposed in the change name, the change of the name, um, it, it shows a more political position. Um, it shows that we're talking about both women in academia and outward facing in terms of what we're doing with psychology. Um, it's trying to sort of acknowledge that we live in an unequal world and that psychology of women is not just defined by the gender norms, but it's intersected by class, race and sexuality. Now, by naming this and naming specific groups, and we're talking about here I'm not ethnic groups, women living in poverty, etc., it does feel like a step in a more political direction. Uh, and I'll be interested in perhaps catch Catherine later to hear about what conversations happened in the BPS about that. I imagine there's a backstory there. Um, but to summarise, sort of in terms of the history of POWs, uh, from early active activist beginnings. Uh, and sort of debates around sort of inside out, do we work inside, do we work outside? Are we talking about feminist psychology, are we talking about psychology of women? It feels like the debate and the conversation has come a very long way. And indeed to a more political position, which I think is great. I think things have changed alongside it in terms of uh, authentic debates about what we do with uh, psychology and our psychological power. Uh, leading to a much more nuanced and sophisticated interpretation of the sort of, of the permanent boundary around what's apolitical, what's political with a small p, and what's political with a large p. I think we're in a much more sophisticated position now. So, uh, just my sort of final thought really is returning to this rhetorical question which I set myself as the sort of title of this talk, you know, power to change. Um, I think POWs has seen, has shown the power to change, both in itself in terms of responding and changing as the context changes um, and the professional environment changes, but also in terms of the sort of power of psychology and to try and use psychology to change and enact things for other people. And I think we see this very much with this recent proposal of, of changing the name. Um, so I think it's got a great future. Um, and that's not going to work. Why is it not working? No. Uh, I had a nice little bit at the end there, which is about basically if we could just fit R in, you know, just after that E, you know, it would be a really neat, nice development in the naming of POWs. 
So I leave you with that thought. Can we think of an R just to stick it in there, please? So thank you very much.